This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello, and welcome to spring. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford, I'm a clinical psychologist. And I've been working out of Fayetteville, Arkansas for over 25 years, seeing patients daily. I love what I do. And so I decided a year and a half or so ago to reach out and actually extend the walls of my practice to those of you who may already have psychological interests or be in therapy, but also to those of you who might never darken the door of a psychologist or a therapist. I thought maybe you'd be a little curious about what someone like me would have to say and that it might be helpful to you. So welcome to Self Work. We're going to be talking today about creating a family of friends. I'm going to mention part of a really stressful time for myself that made me aware of both the love of my family and my friends and how all of that was so important. But you know, not all of us have a great family. Some people are estranged from their family or other families are just disappointing, especially in stressful times. So I think it's important to know how to create a family of friends. What has to change in your own thinking? What emotions do you have to work through? How do you learn to trust, especially if you've been hurt by your own family? So we'll talk about that today. And then the email from a listener, which happens every week, included a simple question, one sentence in fact. When your child or your adult child tells you about sexual abuse, what do you do? So again, Welcome to today's Self Work, and we'll get right down to talking about friends. Some of you have emailed me that one of the things you like about Self Work is the fact that I talk a little bit about my own life. I'm not just a a therapist talking head that's not (laughs) mentioning anything about her own struggles. So here comes another story. In about mid-May of 2016, my son graduated from college in Nashville, Vanderbilt, in fact, and I was so proud of him. My heart really swelled with pride. But two days later, that heart was still my focus because I thought I was either about to have a heart attack or a stroke. When I got to the hospital, I had chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness, nausea, and a tight pressure I had never felt. Or, if I'm perfectly truthful, I'd actually felt many times within the last month, but I had denied its significance. This time it was really off the charts. After about a day and a half of heavy medications to bring down what was sky-high blood pressure, plus going through every heart procedure you could have diagnostically, I learned that I had an unusual, fairly unusual heart condition called Prinz Metals Angina, or coronary vasospasm which can be treated through medication. The symptoms mimic those of having a heart attack. But it's not actually your heart muscle that's involved. It's an interesting kind of issue. I'll have a link to it in the show notes. But I was glad to hear that it wasn't something more serious. That's certainly what I learned medically. Yet that whole couple of days reminded me so much of what is really meaningful about life. My family and friends rose to the occasion for sure. My son slept on the floor beside me, putting off a camping trip he'd been planning for months with friends. My husband took care of everything that had to be taken care of. They were both so upset, and I was trying so hard to not look upset for them. My secretary took a whole day of her weekend to call all the patients I couldn't see because I wouldn't be back. My brothers looked up information for me. My sister-in-laws were very constant in their support. I had a physician who's a nephew, and he was very involved. In fact, he knew a lot of the people at the hospital. And I had other nephews that were also wonderful. But it was also my friends. I was actually somewhat surprised by the fact that I reached out to them and let them know. I'm sort of a loner, so it was an unusual kind of choice for me. But they were so, so supportive and concerned. Of course, all to a T, they said, now maybe you'll slow down. (laughs) 
But they all sent their own kind of prayers. If I can wax a little sentimental here, I thought about my dad who had had major cardio issues himself. And what he would say was focus on all that you have and not on what you can't control. And he would have reminded me to tell my son I wasn't afraid. So I made sure I did that. But you know, let's face it. Many of us don't have the words of a wonderful dad as a guide or a family that's standing by at a moment's notice. And perhaps you're one of those people. I strongly believe that you can still experience family. You know, there's three different categories of families. Your biological family, the family you grew up in. Your family of creation, which is your primary relationship, and then your kids. And there's what's termed a family of choice. In fact, I have a plaque in my office that says, friends are your family of choice. You can create relationships that will be there for you. People who will love you the way you should have been loved. But what do you have to do emotionally to build a family of friends or a family of choice? How do you trust, especially if you've been hurt by family? How do you learn to trust others to let them in? Actually, the same conditions I'm going to talk about apply to trying to find romantic love as well. But when you meet somebody, how do you know that they would be a safe choice, a good choice to join your family of choice? There are five things. First of all, to recognize that trust is earned, not given. Children innately trust parents. And then, of course, some find out that that trust isn't deserved. But with friends, trust is earned from the very beginning of the relationship. And some people want you to trust them completely right away and almost get offended if you don't. You have to watch out for those people because, as I said, trust is earned. I'm a therapist and I tell people all the time, it's my job to earn your trust. Have you met somebody that maybe wants to know intimate details before you're ready to tell them? That doesn't feel good. So, a good practice is to share small things with someone slowly and see how they handle it. If, for example, a confidence isn't kept, or if some vulnerability is thrown into your face, then trust cannot be given. The second caveat to choosing someone who'll turn out to be a good friend is to listen how they talk about other people. If you hear blame or gossip about others from your newfound friend, then realize that one day... It's going to be your turn. In fact, I had a friend long ago who I had seen cut off friends, just decide not to be friends with them anymore. And I thought, oh, well, okay, that's her MO, but that will never happen to me. Well, it did happen to me. So you want to pay attention and tune in to both how they treat other people and how they talk about other people. I promise you, it will only be a matter of time before it's your turn. So here's a third caveat. See if what they say and what they do match. There's a psychological term for this called congruency, meaning what's inside of you shows on the outside. It's the same. Someone lives by their values and their actions match those values. If they don't, if they're incongruent, for example, if they say they're honest, but When someone gives them too much change, they keep it. You have to watch for those things and realize you want somebody whose behavior matches who they say they are. The fourth is to recognize if there's a fairly even balance of give and take and boundaries are respected. For example, are you always texting them? Do they call back or text back within a decent amount of time? But of course, there's some people who get offended or get their feelings hurt when you don't text back in about 10 seconds. But we're not talking about that. If days and days go by when you've texted them and they haven't texted you back, then there's probably a problem. Do they want to borrow money from you all the time? And if they do, do they pay it back? Again, are they rushing the relationship or do they withdraw without telling you why? This latter could be depression, but do they talk about it? You really want from the very get-go, to have an even balance of give and take and to know that the other person's life is really pretty good 
and your relationship with them and theirs with you is only going to enhance your life. When I first moved to Fayetteville from Dallas, I didn't have my license yet. I had to wait out about eight or nine months and take the licensure exam so I could set up my own office. And I met someone who was another mental health professional. She was very nice, said she just liked me immediately and wanted to set up an office space with me and showed me where she was working. We had lunch a couple of times. I knew no one in Fayetteville, Arkansas, so it was nice to have someone interested in me and give me such support. She was going out of town for vacation in a couple of weeks, and she asked me if I could see her patients, and I had to explain to her the licensure issue. So I didn't do that, but I was beginning to feel a little bit creepy, like, wow, this is going really fast. And then she came back from vacation, and she had brought me a fairly expensive gift. That's when I knew that my gut was telling me something right, and I needed to listen to it. It was not easy to back out of this relationship, even though it was only really in its infancy that she was determined to become a best friend. So I believe I just told her it was going way too fast and I needed to slow down. And then I gradually withdrew from the relationship. So you can look for clues about whether someone's needy or might have an agenda with you that they're not being clear about maybe themselves and certainly not being clear about with you. And the whole give and take thing can be a big signal there. The fifth and last thing, and this is true especially if you've been hurt by your own family, or friends for that matter, you have to recognize that you may have your own level of fear or discomfort with being known well. It may feel very vulnerable to you. As I was thinking about this, I thought about my brothers. I have two of them. You know, they've known me from the day I was born since I'm the youngest. They watched as I fell off high school graduation platforms, which I did. I had one car wreck after another. I was a terrible driver. I struggled through two divorces. I don't really have to do any work for me to feel that they know me pretty dang well. They don't understand me all the time, or I them, but we know each other. It can be harder to let someone in as an adult. You may, in fact, have even grown up in a family that said you can't trust anybody but family. Or, of course, your fear could be insecurity. If they know everything about you, they'll reject you. So you have to work on your own sense of competence and confidence. Building your own family of choice takes work. It takes years sometimes. But it seems better to me than staying emotionally paralyzed, angry, or bitter because you don't have relationships or close relationships with your own families. You know, so many of us live far away from our actual biological families. So this could become even more important if you have a good relationship with your family, but you don't see them very often. A lot of people in my office will say something like, I can't burden my friends or they're not real family. But I think that this is probably an excuse because you may just be uncomfortable and fear rejection if you let friends know what's really going on. But remember that whole give and take issue. You also might want to remember that when it's your turn to give, when it's your turn to listen, when it's your turn to be there for them, you'll do it. You can build your own network of very caring people who will be there for you when you need them. When you think about shows like Friends or so many of the entertainment that we watch, we're intrigued by people who aren't family, but who share their lives with one another. You can build that. Again, it takes time, but you can do it. Let's go over the five things again. They have to earn your trust and you theirs. When you're choosing them, you want to listen to how they talk about other people. You want to see if what they say and what they do match. You want to make sure there's an even balance or fairly even of give and take and that your own boundaries are respected. And then you want to recognize you may have your own fear about really being known well by others than your family. So whether or not your family has been yours since the get-go 
or it's been carefully created by you. It really doesn't have to matter. When push comes to shove, like when I was in that bed at the hospital in Nashville, all I cared about was their love. That's really all that counted. So here's our email from a listener. It was very simple. One question. What words do I use to help my 24-year-old son that has finally told us of his abuse? He's in therapy. That was it. (laughs) Obviously a very difficult thing to hear that someone you love and have treasured has been hurt by someone else. So here's my answer. First of all, what a wonderful question to ask. What it reveals is that you're aware of the depth and difficulty of talking about what happened. You might be amazed at how mishandled, even discounted this situation often is. So good for you. As an aside, I've had many, many patients tell me that the abuse, of course, was difficult. But when someone didn't believe them that it had happened, it was like being victimized all over again. But let me get back to my answer. I would suggest telling your son that you're there to listen whenever he feels ready to talk more about what happened. I often say to my own patients that the last thing I want therapy to do is to somehow re-victimize them. So I never push. I let them go at their own pace and tell me if they can't or don't want to go further. You can certainly read books or articles about whatever kind of abuse it was so that you can try to understand how it may have affected him and then support him in going to therapy. He may need someone who has a very objective stance and you're his parent. So you can try, but a therapist is also greatly beneficial. If he's like most abuse victims, he's afraid others will see him differently if they know. So there's a balance between supporting him, asking him again when he's ready, how it's affected him, and treating him with kid gloves. What he needs to see in your eyes is acceptance and love. I know it must have been difficult for you to hear. Since you don't reveal the circumstances, I don't know if you're carrying guilt around for it yourself. Should you have known? Could you have prevented it? If you are, getting therapy of your own might be called for. And of course, if it's somebody in your own family, that creates a whole different scenario. Finding out something like this is its own kind of trauma. And having good boundaries where all of that is concerned is important as well so that your son doesn't feel he's got to now prop you up. An experienced therapist can help you work through whatever it is you might be feeling, give you a safe place so that you can be better there for him. So many people never talk about their sexual abuse, so this young man coming forward to his parents is a very good thing. Often it is in the telling of it that a person can let go of so much of the shame. I hope if you have this in your life or you love someone that does, that my suggestions will be helpful to you as well. There are a lot of ways to reach out to me if you'd like. I have a website, drmargaretrutherford.com, where I post weekly. In fact, if you subscribe over there, you'll get a weekly newsletter with a copy of my blog posts and my podcasts. So that's a really easy way to keep up with me. You can email me, which I love. I love to find out who y'all are. I can see where you're from, but I can't see anything else about you. So it really helps me feel connected. My email is askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. Of course, I'd love you to subscribe wherever you listen, or you can subscribe again to my website. And I've got a Facebook page. You can head over there. I post a lot of articles that I find interesting. That's simply facebook.com slash drmargaretrutherford. And I'm on Instagram and Pinterest I've got this social media thing. (laughs) And of course, I'd love for you to leave a rating or a review. 
especially on iTunes. That's really helpful. I've got 90 now, which I'm so pleased about. I'd love to break three digits. It takes absolutely no time, just a few seconds. I haven't had a review in a while, which is simply two or three sentences and can be done anonymously. So I'd so appreciate it if a handful of you could do that as well. March has been a banner month as far as listenership is concerned, and I welcome everyone that's new. I so appreciate you being here and would love to hear your ideas about future podcasts. Thanks so much. Enjoy those friends you have, and perhaps there are a couple you could begin to think of as your family of choice. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and you've been listening to Self Work.